We are, we've climbed the mountaintop. Uh, we are at panel seven out of seven, and this is going to be a doozy in a really, really good way. Um, we're going to get started. This one is about national security and resilience. Um, I've mentioned a couple times over the course of the day that we work very closely with, um, with a lot of members of Congress to pull this off, including Representative Tonko and the Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition. Sharon, thank you for the help with the room. Um, the leadership, uh, Representative Tonko is part of the caucus, but on the, on the Senate side, uh, the, the caucus is co-chaired by Senators Reed and Crapo, and by, uh, co uh, vice chaired by Senators Van Hollen and Collins, and on, on the House side, Representative Cleaver uh, is our co-chair. We're currently looking for Republicans, so if you have any, if you have any leads, uh, we're, we're actively looking. Um, this panel is one that Senator Reed and Senator Crapo feel very, very strongly about. Um, Senator Reed for obvious reasons, chair of the Armed Services Committee. Senator Crapo, you heard on the last panel, Brees mentioned Idaho National Lab, and there's a lot of really interesting stuff happening out there, and Senator Crapo feels very strongly about that. So much so that he's joining us today via video remarks. So my colleague Dan O will pull up a quick video from Senator Crapo to help us get started, and then we'll get underway, and then it's, uh, it's five o'clock somewhere right here. <laughs> Hello, and thank you all for attending the 2024 Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo. I extend my gratitude to EESI for putting this expo together every year. Additionally, I thank my co-chair, Senator Reed, as well as our deputy co-chairs, Senator Collins and Senator Van Hollen, for their collaboration on the caucus's important issues. The REEE Caucus and the EESI provide valuable opportunities to share ideas across the aisle and find bipartisan support for different clean energy objectives. Our country has seen unprecedented growth in the renewable energy sector. This growth has contributed to our national energy supply and security. I'm particularly proud to represent Idaho, where roughly 80% of our electricity comes from clean energy sources, 60% from hydropower, and 20% from renewables. Idaho is also a national leader in the development of new clean energy technology, thanks to numerous research initiatives and public-private partnerships at the Idaho National Laboratory. The INL is making continuous breakthroughs in clean energy technologies in fields such as biomass fuels and nuclear fuel and power generation. Here in the Senate, we have made significant legislative breakthroughs supporting these efforts over the past few years as well. Last year, I joined several of my Senate colleagues in introducing the Advance Act in the U.S. Senate. And in June of this year, the Senate passed the bulk of the Advance Act by a vote of 88 to 2. With the passage of the Advance Act, it is clear that Congress and Americans across the country are acknowledging the important role that nuclear energy will play, and it will continue to play this role in our nation's future, and the need to continue developing and improving these technologies. If signed into law, this legislation would further the modernization of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission licensing process, the facilitation of American nuclear leadership, and investments in advanced nuclear technologies. I look forward to continued work on the REEE caucus to further good bipartisan legislation that benefits all Americans, both rural and urban. The answers to our energy security needs can be found here with input from valuable members of the energy industry from across the political spectrum. Again, thank you for coming to today's Expo and lending your time and experience to these discussions. I look forward to working with all of you in the future. Sorry, it's just so much easier to watch from over there than to... I agree. I know, you know. Um, that was great. Thank you to Senator Crapo and his great staff for uh, helping us pull this panel together. Same goes for Senator Reid, of course, uh, and, and really everyone uh, really came together. 
Uh, we're going to get started very briefly. If you're new to the expo today, uh, we're going to have about five-ish minute presentations from each of our panelists, and then we'll have a little bit of Q&A. Um, we will definitely be done by five o'clock because that's when the reception starts and I have to be over there. So uh, we'll have hopefully a really great discussion. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us. And to kick us off, we are extremely honored to have the Honorable Brendan Owens. I know, but it's, I have to say it. It's what happens, right, when you get to that level. Uh, the Honorable Brendan Owens. Brendan is Assistant Secretary of Defense for Energy, Installations, and Environment at the U.S. Department of Defense, and he's our kickoff speaker on our panel. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. My, my pleasure, and I want to thank the ESI. As you mentioned, Senator Reid does chair this, and Senator Reid also chairs the Senate Armed Services Committee, so uh, aligning those things is something that uh, is, is central to the work that I get to do in my job, both uh, as the EINE Assistant Secretary, Energy Installations and Environment, but I am also uh, serving as the Chief Sustainability Officer for the Department of Defense now. We aligned those jobs earlier this year because there is such a direct overlap. I want to start with basically kicking off by saying that the reason that the Department of Defense cares about these issues is because it is vital to our mission. And I think that that's the thing that animates all the work that is being done inside the building is that we are looking to enhance our ability to execute DOD's missions. And I'll talk a little bit about how that, how that lays out here. So the, the work that we're doing is really about responding to the challenges that we are facing in a contested logistics environment and in a contested homeland. Now, that is complicated by climate change as an amplifying factor. All of that is recognized as central to what the, the work that our teams are doing and the military departments are doing to address those challenges in both the national defense strategy, and you'll see that written and layered into strategies that have been written by the Department, by the Office of the Secretary of Defense and Army, Navy, and Air Force related to climate change. So we are in the process of adapting to and mitigating the impacts associated with both the natural and man-made challenges associated with climate change, but also the increasing threat vectors from uh, our, our grids being more contested and all those things. So that's one of the things that we want to make sure that we understand. The other challenge that we are facing, and we are really addressing it aggressively, is the impacts associated with climate change. So we're seeing extreme precip precipitation, flash, flash flooding at West Point causing significant damage, mild, wildfires in Maui. Every, every dollar that we spend responding to one of those crises is a dollar that we're not spending doing doing the mission. And we're not talking about small amounts of money. A billion dollars at Offutt Air Force Base, three billion dollars at Camp Lejeune, five billion dollars at Tyndall Air Force Base. It's looking more and more like the, 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 the Mawar response to the super typhoon that hit Guam is going to be our first ten billion dollar uh, response, to disaster response. All of that means that our service members aren't doing what their job is. And to illustrate that, between 2016 and 2021, we spent, four, uh, the, the National Guard spent about 14,000 personnel days doing response to wildfires. It, since that time, we've spent about 176,000 personnel days responding to wildfires, right? That is 482 years worth of training time that has been lost in response to wildfires. So these are very significant impacts. DOD's budget is big. We have a lot of personnel. But even the, these are rising to the level of really, really challenging and almost existential threats to our ability to execute the mission. So we're focusing on adapting to or losing military capabilities, and we're doing that across a multitude of dimensions. We're looking at infrastructure, and I want to talk a little bit about what we've done to, to address the challenges that we're looking at in terms of increasing our resilience from an infrastructure standpoint. So the... Energy resilience work that we've been doing is, is focused on energy supply, efficiency, and making sure that we are postured to be able to respond to any disruption. Um, that sort of stacks in a, in a very simple way. We're trying to reduce the amount of energy that we need to operate our installations and operate our, our, our weapons platforms. We are trying to substitute 
and create energy diversity wherever we can, making sure that we are not dependent on one source of energy supply that is disruptable in one form or another, and then rapidly leveraging uh, the advancements that are happening in the clean energy markets to make sure that we are staying current with all of those things. So from a physical domestic infrastructure standpoint, we're not operating under one scenario. We're trying to mitigate all future scenarios, whether that's rising sea level for the Department of the Navy, whether it's wildfires and in a lot of the places that the Air Force operates. Um, and I think that one of the things that we are learning from current conflicts around the world is that our energy infrastructure from day one of a conflict, actually from day minus 30, depending on which way you're looking at it, is already an attack vector. So if you look at what's happening in Ukraine, we are trying to apply the lessons that we have seen with the Russian invasion and the way that they have targeted energy infrastructure as a weapon um, is something that we are looking to actively mitigate, both domestically and looking at our overseas posture as well. I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing from an operational energy standpoint. Um, operational energy is, so we have the installation energy, that's the pretty, pretty self-explanatory, that's the energy that's used by our installations both domestically and abroad. Our operational energy footprint is also significant. 70% of our carbon footprint is in our operational energy. And that's the planes, ships, tanks, everything that we deploy into theater to go and, 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 and fight wars. So we're working across a number of domains to mitigate the challenge that we have from a contested logistics standpoint to make sure that we can get fuel where it needs to go, that we are minimizing the amount of fuel that we have to push forward into theater, and we're working through a series of different mechanisms to do that. One of the things that, that our office does is run the Operational Energy Capability Improvement Fund, OECIF, um, and the Operational Energy Prototyping Fund. This is an early stage, early stage uh, R&D research uh, focus that's allowing us to be able to develop new capabilities that then our OEPF, our prototyping fund, pushes into the military departments and into the hands of the warfighter intended to enhance their ability to both adapt to and then project greater amounts of power. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip a couple things. In conjunction with a lot of the partners that we're working with, we do partner with ASHRAE. Dennis and I had a nice little moment about the temperature in the room uh, a, a little bit earlier. Um, we're trying to make sure that we are dragging as much and, and cross-pollinating and integrating as much of the best thinking that's out there right now to, to address energy use at the 550 installations that are in our portfolio, and then also making sure that we're addressing the needs of the warfighter while we're doing that. So capitalizing on all of those in opportunities that span both the installation and operational challenges so that we can make sure that we are doing everything that we can to deter conflict, which is our number one priority, and remain agile and flexible if we do need to have uh, any things that would, that would make us be required to deploy across, uh, across the globe for whatever that is. So, I want to thank again. I'm looking forward to the questions that we have that are coming up, but I will pass it over to the next folks to make sure that we have time to get those questions out. Thank you, Brendan. And that brings us to our second panelist. Swathi Viravali is the Director of Climate Security and Adaptation at the White House National Security Council. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much to um, SE, and thank you very much for you all for being here, and similar to Brendan. Looking forward to the discussion. Uh, I'll try and keep my remarks brief, but I'll perhaps zoom it out a little bit more than um, Assistant Secretary Owens offered and perhaps offer some thoughts on the connections between national security as well as connection to uh, broader resilience efforts as well as climate change. Um, tackling the climate crisis through modern industrial growth, modern industrial growth will, uh, will build fairer and more global economic orders for the benefit of ourselves and for people everywhere, not just today, but those to come. Let me contextualize for three reasons why this approach is necessary. President Biden and our national security strategy states that shared challenges impact every, people everywhere, demand increased global co cooperation, and nations stepping up to their responsibilities at a moment in time when this has become difficult. He also emphatically states that the world is at an inflection point, and due to the intersection of ch challenges as well as opportunities, we, we have a... a, we have a an ability to cease the dis this decisive decade in order to tackle these shared challenges. 
And in fact, cooperating on shared challenges is in the face of global competition is the subtitle of the section in the national security strategy that introduces climate change. And in this cooperation, where we collectively build mutually assured resilience, occurs by working together to enhance our respective capabilities and collective capacity to respond to the climate crisis. And in this manner, we can assure not only our own resilience to changing impacts, but also those of our partners and to the threats that we face from a changing climate. And so how do we do this? And more to the point, how do we do this effectively? And we'd like to offer three reasons that we need to do this. First, climate change impacts, even localized ones, can resonate across different geographies and strategic domains. And the local impact of the intersection of energy, health, and food security can and will reverberate globally with massive consequences upon global supply chains and economic security, which is uh, an undercurrent theme of, of Assistant Secretary Owen's remarks. Second, local climate shocks can have massive, local, uh, massive regional implications as they propagate through social, economic, and geopolitical relationships. Understanding which regions will be overcome by climate impacts and relevant regional institutions that can help us prioritize focus on strategies will enable building regional stability. Third, for countries with a low adaptive capacity, particularly those in fragile and conflict-afflicted er areas, climate impacts will not only stymie so societal development, but also lead to local and national security concerns. And so in order to manage the worst of these impacts and also to facilitate resilience, the U.S., along with our partners and allies, must be able to adopt a three-pronged approach that will allow us to first assess the impacts of climate change-related threats and opportunities. Without the assessments of these impacts of climate change on our security and defense, it's difficult for our, our leaders to react to rapidly changing environments or to plan st uh, strong responses. The United States has state-of-the-art state scientific capabilities, and thanks to this strategic edge, we're able to predict where climate impacts will exacerbate threats and effectively act in advance. Secondly, we must partner for an integrated approach. Each federal department and agency has unique capabilities to contribute, and it's essential that we work together to exercise our comparative, com combine our comparative advantage to respond. Partnerships must also extend to partners overseas at the national, local, and regional levels, including the private sector as well as civil society, including philanthropies and international organizations, to reflect the needs of those who are impacted the most. Finally, we must invest in collective resilience, bolstering the resilience of our own investments, whether it be through our supply chains, physical installations, or the provision of emergency assistance when disaster strikes, advances our national security objectives, and yields economic results. For example, for every dollar invested in extreme weather preparedness can yield as high as $11 in savings down the roads, including by avoiding future humanitarian assistance needs. By adopting this approach, we're able to give governments and communities around the world a critical advantage. Resilience can be built now to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Investments in early warning systems, climate tolerant technologies, and resi resilience overall can yield huge returns on in, in decades to come. In this manner, we protect lives as well as livelihoods. The window of opportunity to deal with shared challenges like climate is narrowing drastically, um, and the actions we take now will, to shape this will to the, shape this period will in, is is uh, is known as an age of conflict or stability, and we must tip the scales in in favor of stability. And in doing so, we avoid the twin perils of both economic risks as well as national security vulnerability. Um, I'll pause there, maybe Dan, and yield the uh, time back to you. Thank you. For, ooh, it's very official. Yield time back. <laughs> uh, the gentlelady from the National Security Council. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to Emma Stewart. Uh, Emma, Senator Crapo had awful nice things to say about INL, so no pressure. You are the chief power grid. Well, you know who you are. Emma is the chief power grid scientist and research strategist at INL in Idaho. Emma, welcome to the panel today. Oh, there we go. Hi there, I'm Emma Stirp, as I said. I, I'm from Idaho National Lab. I lead a lot of our work on uh, securing the digital energy transition, uh, essentially what this future looks like with all of the renewable energy resources we were talking about is digital. We're not necessarily going to have our big analog spinning machines anymore. We're really looking at this future with lots of digital environments working together. Um, but when I describe what we do, I like to use some personal experiences over the last few years of um, when climate security and power grid all came together for me. Um, back in 2020, we were dealing with 
from a cybersecurity world, we were dealing with solar winds, um, a large supply chain event, the Ukraine. Um, we were dealing with many things in the national lab I worked in at the time. And uh, there was also a giant wildfire. Um, there was a massive lightning event that happened in Northern California that was insane to watch, actually. And it was dry lightning. It blew up an entire large power transformer, a substation. We were missing power in half of the city. Um, we'd have to ramp down all of our supercomputers that were doing a bunch of the work to try and help us actually secure this environment. Um, we're also in the middle of COVID, so half our staff were not there. Um, the, the, wild, the wildfire had actually turned around and headed towards the lab. So we were trying to co-op all of our stuff out of the lab into another environment to try and keep doing the work we were meant to be doing. And then we worked at the military base that we were about to work on. Um, basically, it also had a wildfire heading towards it as well and was in similar conditions. So we've had this go on for many years now that the worlds of, sort of climate change, national security are really starting to collide as well. We've got to do something about our climate if we want to actually still keep securing the environment we work in as well, because a lot of people are just affected by this all over. Um, I think we've seen flooding on a number of military bases. We've looked how to raise infrastructure, but at some point we just need to try and make this stop or improve so that we can keep moving forward. Um, the work I do in Idaho National Lab and the Idaho Lab does, um, we're lucky enough we have large scale power testing infrastructure. It's about the size of Luxembourg, I think was a metric I used recently. Um, we have large transmission lines that you can test on. We bring out utilities so they can actually come and see their new things working. Um, if you want a utility to actually adopt new technology, you kind of have to show them where it works and how it works or they will not do it. Um, so we've been working with people to show them how that infrastructure works. But also as we move through this, we need to actually deploy that infrastructure responsibly. Um, it's really easy for us to go buy 50,000 inverters from, um, from another country and install them, but those aren't necessarily the most secure environment that we want to do that with. So we work on how to actually get people to do these kinds of things, but also secure around the problem or even operate through some of the supply chain problems we have so we can just keep going with this infrastructure as well. Um, it's a huge challenge. We, we don't necessarily have as much of the supply in this country as we want of these new power electronic devices. We're growing that. There's massive investment into it. But we're working through how to definitely build protections around these things and help that people deploy, even if you're buying it from somewhere. How do you actually secure that? A lot of the problems we have are just poor configuration, actually. People are really bad at putting their devices on the internet. Um, so we're, we're hoping to keep helping um, people like utilities better secure the devices that they have so that they can really orchestrate and operate this brand new future that they're facing, while also improving our climate situation by reducing our emissions and, and helping us move to that 100% renewable energy style environment in the future. But it's a huge problem um, and a huge opportunity. Um, when I moved to this country to actually work on a lot of these things, it was because I wanted to work in this environment where we had massive problems and massive opportunities to actually fix them so they could be applied globally as well. Because I don't believe we can just fix this problem in the US. It's something we need to work on across the world for us to actually get it done. So that's why I've ended up in this Venn diagram of things where I work in clean energy, cybersecurity, and power grid somehow, and it became popular over the past few years, so I'm really busy. Um, but it's an excellent area to work in. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's my stuff. Thank you, Emma. That was great. Uh, we did a briefing like 15 months ago. We had John, uh, John T. Condesarmi on that briefing. She runs the Net Zero program at INL. Super interesting. Very cool, the amount of stuff you have going yeah. on out there. Have so. to actually walk the walk if we're going to yeah. say you should do it. So, yeah. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Her slides are really impressive. Um, Jennifer Schaefer is the executive director of the Federal Performance Contracting Coalition and one of the best speakers when it comes to energy efficiency. Jennifer, it's always great to have you and FPCC on our panels. I really appreciate that you'll be here today. I'm sorry that you're a little warm, honestly. I'm sorry. We'll have more water if you need it, but I'll turn it over to you. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to say uh, something just, I'm mostly just going to talk about the FPCC a little bit to start with because I feel a little bit like a square peg in a round hole. Everybody's got this huge view of the world. Um, everybody here is thinking big, big thoughts about energy security and resiliency. And we are, the group I, uh, work with really t is about implementing. So it's a slightly different slice. 
Um, so the FPCC, and I want to introduce Dane Farrell. Stand up, Dane. He's our uh, legislative director, so those of you on the Hill. We have several of our members are here as well. Um, Maresco, Johnson Controls, um, Amoresco, got ESG on the phone. So they're around. Our members are the ones who um, are basically approved to do work with the federal government. So the military facilities themselves, our own federal buildings, courthouses, et cetera, to make them more efficient and more resilient. So the mandate, and they do so through performance contracting. So that is our members would go in, evaluate a building, figure out what you can do in that facility or the building to make it more energy efficient and save money and energy and then get paid back through guaranteed energy savings. So it doesn't cost the federal customer money up front. They just have reduced costs going to their utility bills and they pay back for their new infrastructure. It's a great way to get new infrastructure, address bad buildings, you know, troublesome, this, that, and the other thing. My boiler's about to break, my air conditioning stinks. Oops, did I say that here? <laughs> um, <laughs> So, so that's what our members do. And it's an efficiency-based contracting mechanism. But I think that's important in a resiliency panel because efficiency is resiliency. And I think it's getting underappreciated to some extent right now. But if you don't get more efficient, you just got to buy more CFE. We're all very excited about buying clean energy. Um, we're doing that a lot, we're putting a lot of our time and effort into it. There's not enough for us to just replace everything with CFE. We are going to have to get more efficient and match our load. So demand reduction is super important. The other reason it's important is about that implementation on the ground. Like I said, we do efficiency, that's how we get paid back. But we often get paid paid back uh, there's enough savings that we've got enough money we can invest that money in resiliency. So one of the things that's been happening more and more as we focused on resiliency as the federal government is trying to merge funding streams, appropriated dollars, with performance contracting for two really major reasons. One, there is not enough money being appropriated. The Department of Defense is in the worst condition of anybody for that. They are getting shorted more than everybody else. It's just the way it goes. They've got big mission. They've got big deals to do. This is not something where they're going to put their dollars. So leaning forward on efficiency to get some resiliency, I think, is really important. Um, the other reason is that if you buy your resiliency, like I'm going to put a microgrid on Camp Swampy and buy my resiliency, that's great, but you've got to care and feed for that system. How are you going to do that? In performance contracting, there's a guarantee that you will get your savings. There's a guarantee that it will perform or the contractor is going to pay. So we are not very good in the federal government at buying something and giving enough money to it for the care and feeding. We've had things that just die. We had a big enthusiasm a while back where we're going to put a bunch of renewables on military facilities. And we at the, in the performance contracting community have been going back and fixing these systems that were neglected and then died. So we've got to have our resiliency assets last. So those are kind of the two reasons I think performance contracting has a big role in resiliency. We have to take care of the things we install and we can help pay for it through just savings on your energy bill. I mean, what's wrong with that? So I'm looking forward to talking a little more about resiliency. I think you're a perfect fit for this panel. I, I think it makes a ton of <laughs> sense to have an implementer. So thank you, Jennifer. Um, that brings us to Mike Sexton. Mike is the Senior Policy Advisor for Cyber and Artificial Intelligence at Third Way. Mike, welcome to the Policy Forum and Expo. Um, I'm looking forward to what you have to say. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> I'll do my best to keep this brief. Um, I'm the Senior Policy Advisor for Cyber and AI at uh, Third Way's National Security Program. Um, so uh, very humbled to be on this uh, panel with uh, so many uh, distinguished energy experts. Uh, I'm just going to try to talk a bit about my role and explain how that 
informs the approach, uh, in, it explains how I approach the issue of energy. Uh, so I sort of con would conceptualize uh, the way that we think of national security, the way of a lot of thought leaders from like Michelle Flournoy to Eric Schmidt and Henry Kissinger on, with respect to national security, we think long term about competition and rivalry with China and that the essential to competing with China long term, in addition to obviously military capabilities, is going to be success and leadership in AI. That is the second Russian doll inside is succeeding in AI. <clears throat> We're right now doing very well with this with uh, the best frontier models are built in the United States. Uh, there's been reporting from the Wall Street Journal and Financial Times into how onerous uh, Chinese censors are on AI development in China. So the AI competition with China right now looks good, uh, but longer term as we think about implementing AI, if we think about 10 years into the future, how much work might be automated, this is going to require a lot of energy. It's hard exactly to project what that energy for the inference of AI is going to be because it will depend on economically how we implement it. But that final innermost Russian doll is that we need to be able to dominate uh, in energy, electricity, renewable energy production. Um, we are <laughs> uh, uh, very thankful, I would say, that our big tech companies are uh, committed to carbon neutral or clean, uh, adopting clean energy for their increased energy needs. Uh, I think their leadership above and beyond what the United States government uh, tries to implement is something that really deserves uh, recognition. Um, but this is the approach really that I think about energy is the energy needed for AI to support to sustainably support the economic future uh, where we have, where intelligence is no longer a scarce resource and where we fundamentally rethink what we, what we need and what we use to implement, uh, you know, uh, knowledge, knowledge, economy, uh, labor. That was great. Thank you, Mike. Um, I was all I was totally enraptured by that. So thank you very much. If you want another couple minutes, you can have it. Um, you mentioned the renewable energy purchases by the the private sector. I'll just refer back to a panel we had a little bit earlier today. We had Clean Energy Buyers Association (CBA). Uh, they're also in the exhibit space, so they might they're all, they represent the, those companies that Mike you were just talking about. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, so we have a little bit of time for questions before the reception starts, and. Um, I am going to kick off a question. Uh, Jillian has the microphone now. So if I see any hands go up, I will do my best to get Jillian, to dispatch Jillian over to you. Um, but I'd like to, Brendan, maybe we could start with you and then maybe we could go down the line. And this is something kind of building on what Jennifer was talking about a little bit, but I think many of you hit on it. And that is the idea of, you know, how do we take federal policy and make it better through public-private partnerships? Um, are there, how could we better position federal policy to help public-private partnerships advance climate security and resilience goals? What are those kind of opportunities you're looking at? So by way of full disclosure, in a previous life, uh, I worked for an ESCO doing performance contracting. So I have, will, I probably will always carry around the baggage of being a fan of of ESPCs and third-party financing in general. I think uh, Jennifer made some excellent points about the ways that it allows government in general, DOD specifically in the job that I'm in right now, to capitalize operational uh, spending, right? So, so we need to make an investment to, to, to fix a chiller plant. Um, working with an ESCO is, is a great way to do that. But one of the things that I think is important 
from a, from a resilience and a security perspective is making sure that we are layering more than just the energy savings into the mix. So as we look at the, the, the installation as the node that DOD starts from, I think that's the, 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 the jumping off point. So we have been increasingly trying to expand the realm of influence that the department is is capable of providing solutions for. And then the reason, the primary reason that we're doing that is that 70% on average of the people who come to work on a military installation to do the mission live in a community that surrounds it, right? So while we have been inwardly focused to try to make sure that we have resilience on our installations and the lights are on, when we have a bad day, we are not enabling a situation if the community is dark for our people to come to work in the best version of themselves, right? So if a soldier who is coming, who is leaving their family in a dark house, right, because the power's out and the water's out or whatever it is to go to work to do the mission, they're bringing all of that baggage with them. And that's a big problem because the missions that we do have never been more complicated and we need that person, that soldier, that airman, that Marine, that guardian, that sailor, laser focused on what they do. So that's, that's the thing that, that I think that there is a role for federal policy in creating conditions to allow DOD to do more partnership so that solutions that we are deploying inside the fence are creating solutions for the defense communities that we are interdependent on. Thank you. Swathi, what does this look like from your perspective? What would you like to see in terms of more public-private partnerships? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, I think, um, Dan. And, and in order to answer it, I think there's really sort of two, two main key ways that we can do this. One, I think we have to work with our private sector partners um, and leverage the public investments, particularly as we seek to assess the threat landscape. And it's not just the threat landscape, but it's also the opportunities for resilience. So is it AI infrastructure that we need to be leveraging? Is it efficient, more efficient, um, a more efficient grid? But really having that sort of sync between the private sector and, and federal policymakers to ensure that we're making the, the best of the best. You know, what, one example that comes to mind is when we talk about climate security, it's always sort of on the negative, and it's always like, you know, the bad things are going to happen. But, and I think the point of this panel is that there's opportunities associated with that, particularly in the resilience space, and particularly as we make the economic case for resilience. It's just going to save us money and perhaps even make money in the future. And so how are we prepositioning assets in, in a way that is useful? If the, if the federal government can't do it, how are we turning the private sector? Um, in particular, how are we making the adaptation investable. I know we have a heavy mitigation in this room, but the, ad the private sector hasn't really participated, uh, well, the private sector could be doing much more in the in the in, in the adaptation space. I think last year only two percent of global finance um, for adaptation was from the private sector, and so how can we leverage those investments to make more to more make more headway? We were we were looking at a case study of El Nino and in, in sub-Saharan Africa, and if we preposition uh, food assets before the El Nino occurred, which we knew was going to occur, then we could save up to seventy percent higher on not just humanitarian assistance, but also sort of the logistics logistical costs of getting food there. And so I think these are the ways that we can partner with, with the private sector in a more tangible way. 2% of the total, and that total wasn't nearly enough. No, no. not enough. Yeah, so it's even worse. Emma? Um, spinning off the responsibility aspects here as well, um, we talk a lot about how utilities need to do something better, they need to get the power there better, they need to get the lights on quicker. We have, have this kind of responsibility model for them. Um, what we, what I see as being necessary from the policy level is responsibility sitting on those that actually supply the components or supply the equipment or build the software. Um, from a security standpoint, we've, we've obviously had problems in the last few weeks. I don't, if anyone has a Windows computer, they've probably had some problems. Um, but there's, there's a sort of responsibility aspect that that then falls to the user to, to fix the problem somehow. And those humans are not necessarily computer science experts that know how to remove a syslog file. Um, so we're, we're in this world where we need to put more responsibility onto the people actually building and selling the components from my perspective. We're working with them. There is options. 
There's things like uh, Secure by Design from, from DHS. DOE has Energy Cyber Sense principles. We're asking manufacturers to definitely buy into doing these things, like do things right the first time. Don't try and bolt on something later on. But we just really need people to actually start taking up those things and doing it before they sell a product out to each individual customer because it is the people in the defense communities or on the, the military bases or in the national labs that are stuck with these components wondering what they're meant to do. So if we want to get there and we want everything to work, those companies that are making the money off of selling the components need to actually be responsible for them as well from my perspective. Thanks so much. Jennifer, I have a hunch of what you're going to say, but I'm well, very curious. I have so much I want to say, so I just don't know what to pick on. Um, one is totally agree with the people who provide the components should take care of the components. That's why using a performance using a performance contract might be useful in that situation because we have to take care of the components. We have to make somebody do that. Um, so love that. Swathi said earlier when she was doing her introductory remarks, you need to assess, you need to partner, there's your third party, and you need to bolster resilience. One of the other things you need is you need money, right? You need money. We don't have enough money all by ourselves. Uh, the government's never going to have enough money. And again, private sector taking responsibility is a piece of that. But um, those were the things I really just wanted to key off of that other people were talking about. <laughs> You are like so in the weeds, and I am, I am so grand weeds. strategic. You should be sitting over here. Um, no, I, um, I'll, I'll, I'll keep this quick. I, um, you know, uh, I, we're, I, we, we need obviously a resilient grid. I think, you know, just long term about the, the sheer volume of energy, of electricity that is needed to electrify vehicles, to electrify everything we can to, to convert to renewable energy, um, as well as to supply the needs for artificial intelligence. Um, and it just, uh, it, it becomes, again, this, this funny Russian doll where uh, suddenly the question of how do we win at national security suddenly turns on the question of innovating in nuclear fission, you know, um, fission fusion. I always mix it up. I caught myself that time. Um, nuclear fusion. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> you can tell that I'm not the actual energy person here. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm really hopeful that the innovations that are currently underway, some of the breakthroughs that are underway can bring us to a place of energy abundance where we're not thinking about how can our grid, uh, you know, take in all of this AI work and we are instead thinking about creating as much energy as we can uh, to allocate whatever we need uh, that can be automated in the economy. Thank you, Mike. I'm looking for hands. Oh, I see one. Oh, you're definitely going to get to ask a question, Sharon. I'm Sharon with the House Sustainable Energy Environment Coalition. Thank you so much for that panel. Um, this question might be targeted a little bit more towards Assistant Secretary Owens, um, but I'm wondering how you all think of this idea that DOD can kind of be a proving ground for new technologies, pushing the boundaries of energy efficiency and resiliency that can be propagated and benefit the wider community. Um, if there's any specific technologies you'd like to highlight, that would be great. Um, but how do we in Congress help support those types of DOD programs that help develop state-of-the-art technologies um, that benefit everyone? I think it's a great question. I think there's any number of places where DOD has a has a phenomenal track record doing exactly that. Some of those tend to be niche applications, uh, specifically specifically maybe only for uh, defense applications. But the the places where the couple of places that you mentioned, maybe I just take slight issue with the idea that I don't think we really need to do much proving the value of energy efficiency. It's, it's a thing that needs to be, you know, depending on how you slice it, first, second, and third on the list uh, from, a, from a facility and installation perspective for a lot of the reasons that Jennifer highlighted. The, the places where I think that we can be more 
uh, collaborative and, and do some and do some creativity that would allow for the the proving out of models are are really related to interdependency and connection. Right. So I mentioned the defense community and the and the, and the reliance that the installation has on the people who live in the defense community. One of the things that we've been increasingly looking at from a from an installation energy perspective is finding ways to co-locate energy generation resources, clean energy generation resources that are serving the installation as their primary function, but also pushing out power into the defense community. DOD has land, we have load, we have good fences, right? So those are things when you think about grid vulnerability and you look at, and you go to North Carolina and you shoot out a transformer with a high powered rifle and knock out power to uh, significant parts of of both DOD re, uh, of DOD mission, but also uh, more civilian missions, and then wait around for the transformer replacements to come. When we've offshored all of that manufacturing capacity, um, that intersection of security plus resilience plus uh, mission continuity is one where I think there's a tremendous amount that we can bring to the table that isn't necessarily something that DOD, I'll blame it on us for a minute, that D hasn't, traditionally DOD hasn't been looking at, but I don't think utilities have necessarily been looking at DOD as a, pro as a solve in this problem. They've been, they've been looking at us at as, as a customer rather than a partner. And I think you can layer in grid flexibility, we can layer in storage, we can layer in uh, all sorts of other, we're electrifying all of our vehicles. That's a huge battery that should be leveraged in a very proactive way uh, to be able to solve challenges that are more than just just DOD, and we should be doing it in partnership with, with the utilities. That was a good question, and that was a good answer, but does anyone else have any thoughts that they would like to chime in with? Uh, of course. Je Thank you. Of course I do. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so I agree with everything Brendan just said. And there are policies we could put forward that might make it easier. But I think there is, to your question, there, there are enough policies on the table. What we don't have is commitments on implementation. So things fall off. We have big, oh, beautiful goals. We've got so many things we want to get done. We have it all written out in a way that's phenomenal. But we haven't gotten to go in a lot of places. And I think we're, in some sense, waiting for the perfect. And it is the enemy of the good. We could be improving our resilience right now very well with things on the table today. Um, as Brendan was talking about, um, at the same time investigating new technologies. One of the things our partners, our members get every time we do a performance contract and every time we have a high level meeting with, a, with somebody from the administration, whether it's an agency or the White House or whoever is, what are you doing to put new technologies into the federal government? And boy oh boy, we are always looking for those new technologies. And they come out because they're a risk, because no one wants to pay for the risk of a new technology. So how do we overcome that? How do we get agencies to want to help share in the risk of trying something brand new that might look really <coughs> awesome uh, in the future, but doesn't quite pen out right now? So I think there's a lot. You asked a very good question. There are a lot of answers. Um, and uh, some are better than others, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, judgment. All right, so um, Mike, maybe what we'll do is we'll start with you and maybe we'll come this way. You talked in your opening remarks about, so you said something like a 10-year time horizon. Mm -hmm. um, but what about five years? Mm -hmm. So I'll challenge each one of you to offer maybe one thing that if you came back to the Expo five years from now, what's one thing you would like to say has happened that would um, uh, improve national security or enhance national security resilience through deployment of renewable energy and energy efficiency technology? Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, 
I think there are lots of things below the breakthroughs that I would like to see in nuclear fusion. Got that correct. <laughs> fusion. Um, the use of AI to better distribute energy loads across the electric grid, um, the use of AI to improve cyber security for the electric grid, um, AI to enhance physical security uh, at electricity generation stations. Um, I think the, the physical security risk is something that we uh, can underestimate. Um, so I think all of these different um, AI applications are things that we could implement certainly within the, the next five years. The technology is here today, um, but would absolutely love to see more breakthroughs um, in uh, renewables and, and sustainable energy production as well. Thanks, Mike. Jennifer? Um, my perfect world in five years is that um, the government recognizes um, that we need all of the different kinds of funding streams to work together to make progress in our resiliency and also in our security. So right now, we talk a lot about we're going to get more resilient, we're going to get more efficient, but we've got funding streams that don't cross well. So we have ERSIP that's, oh, we're going to do all of our resiliency with ERSIP money, and then maybe we'll do some performance contracting over here. Those things should all be planned when you talk about the out years, and five years is out years. They should all be planned together. What are the funding streams I might see internally? How can I apply them to best get what I want? How do I make sure it's all cyber secure? Where's that money going to come from? How much of it can I get from those silly little energy savings? Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, you're pretty big. Um, and what other funding streams can I bring in to make sure I get my renewable energy, it is cyber secure, I have reduced my demand, and I now have a resilient facility in front of me? Thanks. Emma? I would really like to say in the next five years that we've built such a massive supply chain for power electronic devices in the US that we're desperately asking all of the students to go into high school and learn how to build them. I would love to see that we just have factories and building this manufacturing base so that we actually have it so we can easily supply it and tell they'll have gold stamps saying they're nice and secure also. That's my, that's my grand goal for five years. That's pretty good, that's a pretty good one. Swathi? Um, yeah, it's, it's a, another great question. I think from my perspective, it would be great to, to see in five years the adaptive capacity or the ability to cope with future change mm -hmm. um, of both Americans improved, but also our partners and allies abroad. <laughs> I think from my perspective as a policymaker, people always argue for more proliferation of data, more proliferation of technology, which is fine and good, and we've heard sort of the, the necessity of that from as we seek to build resilience. But I find that often people are not using what we have already, you know, and, and so it's really the use of that technology in an appropriate way that will allow us to hedge off those future impacts of climate uh, that will allow us to increase our own adaptive capacity. I, com coming back to El Nino, you know, NOAA does such a great job of forecasting when future impacts of climate are going to occur um, from in the next, you know, two to three years. And so what are we doing with that information? And I think we're just not making enough empowered choices on the adaptation front. So that's my sort of soapbox. Great. Brendan, I think this means you get the last word, not just of the panel, but of the day. Of the day. Wow. A lot of pressure. Um, <laughs> Uh, this this has been really interesting from, from my perspective. So I want to thank you for for pulling us all together to be able to to, to learn from each other. Hopefully, we've I've learned from y'all. So right on, and and the and uh, the previous panel as well. Earlier, but last year, uh, our team issued policy to the military departments that required them to begin the process of electrifying their installations, looking at buildings and saying all of our loads that can be electric should be electric because electricity as the common battlefield fuel of an installation allows for a significant amount of diversity in energy resources. We can get it from wind, we can get it from solar, we can get it from batteries, we can get it from a pile of potatoes, a cathode, an anode, and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a copper wire. We can make electricity out of a lot of different things, right? So that creates the conditions for that resilience to occur and that diversity drives our ability to make to take one attack vector away from from the the adversaries 
In addition to that, we are looking at all the things that are happening to do resilience of the, of the grid and distribution infrastructure. Um, and I think that in five years, what I hope is that the combination of all of those things will have greatly complexified the use of energy as, as an attack vector in, in, from, a, from a homeland perspective. Now, whether or not that can be pushed out into, into other theaters is, is a different question. But if we can frustrate our adversaries to the point where they don't feel that they would be able to disrupt power projection, that has extraordinary deterrence value. And I think that we are on the, we're on the, we're in the, moving in the direction of being able to do that. Whether or not that's five years or, or seven years or 10 years or two years, um, that becomes a significant, a significant job. That is a significant job for us because of the deterrence value that it has. Uh, and I think that that's one of the things that the combination of all of those things, reducing our, reducing our energy uh, demand, increasing our ability to flex to different energy resources, and then also hardening uh, the infrastructure that we're reliant on will really make it make it a, a difficult decision to to try to deter. It just increases our deterrence footprint. I think that's ultimately what DOD is trying to make sure that we are capable of doing. Thanks. That was a really interesting uh, panel. I really appreciate that. Um, thank you to Brendan and Swathi and Emma and Jennifer and Mike. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, you're like, oh, it's 5 o'clock. He's been saying, yeah, well, don't go anywhere. Uh, a couple things. One, we had seven panels today. This was just one of them. They were all awesome. Uh, and if you missed any of those panels, you can go back and rewatch them. You can watch them all at www.esi.org. It'll take us a little time to upload the video, but a couple days max. Should definitely encourage you to do that. Uh, we'll also have summary notes, written summary notes for each of the panels within a week or two, probably two weeks, uh, considering it's August starting on Thursday. Uh, so if you don't, if you want to go back and revisit any of the panels, but if you can't watch it or if you're just looking for one particular thing, that's another great resource. Somewhere around here, Aaron was wandering around with a camera. I saw Ainsley too. We have two, we have a lot of great photographers on staff, but we will have amazing photos of this session. So panelists, people in the audience, if you want photos, uh, those are also, uh, those will also be available. Before I let you go, I have a few minutes of captive audience, so I'd just like to say thank you. Many of you on this panel and other panels acknowledge just how much hard work goes into the expo. I do just a fraction of it. I have a great set of colleagues, and so I'd like to say some very special thanks to Becky, who's our expo coordinator. I think she's actually already at the reception. I'm not implying anything by that. I think she just happens to be there because it's five. Um, but Becky uh, puts a ton of work into this, and she does a great job. Same thing with Omri. Uh, he's our vice president of communications. Uh, and I, we just could absolutely not do this event without them. We also could not do and would not want to do the event without Dan O, the other Dan, and Anna for all of their contributions. Uh, we also had tremendous contributions in the lead up to the event and during the event from Allison and Aaron and Molly and Nicole and Susan and David and Ulrich and Miguel. And Susan, David, Ulrich, and Miguel don't always show up to briefings. They have other responsibilities at the organization, but it's really fun when it's all hands on deck. Tim, I did not forget you. Unfortunately, Tim's homesick today and couldn't join us. So Tim, sorry you weren't able to join us. Hopefully you were able to watch as much as possible online. I also saw Jeff and Jonathan helping out across the day. So thank you very much for that. We all have wonderful interns, Jillian, Jillian, you're Jillian, Ainsley, Jillian, and Lindsay helping us with microphones and table staffing and all of that kind of stuff. So thank you very much. I know you all really, really looking forward to this. And in the back of the room, Troy and Alex. I didn't see Scott. Did Scott sneak in? Okay, so Troy and Alex are videographers. Scott's great too, but he's just not here today. Uh, Troy and Alex, thank you so much for helping with the live cast and the video production and all of that kind of stuff. Okay, that's it. It's 5.03. Thank you. We'll conclude. Hopefully everyone at the reception, it'll be a lot of fun. Thank you so much. <laughs>